Well, I must admit, when I first saw the title, which is actually European politics to reconfigure just before the return of Jesus Christ, I almost did a uh, bit of a back turn there. I had to reconfigure the actual title from myself to uh, make a bit of sense of it. But it's a curious topic because I don't consider myself to be any particular expert in the actual uh, topic at hand. Um, there's probably people in here in the room at the moment who have a better understanding of the European politics uh, than I do. Um, however, I always enjoy a challenge. And uh, so tonight is a bit of a history lesson, um, but hopefully the history lesson uh, provides a, a viewpoint um, to current day events and uh, to see how God's dealings uh, with the political, the economical and the environmental issues of today are part of his plan and purpose. First of all, a question. What does an 80s pop song, a nightmare and a zany zoo have to do with European politics? So just some of the things we'll have a look at uh, this evening as we look at the European politics um, at the moment. For some reason, whenever I think of current events, there are two quotes that always end up going through my head. The first one is this, comes from the 80s pop song. We didn't start the fire. It was always burning since the world's been turning. We didn't start the fire. No, we didn't light it, but we tried to fight it. That's the chorus from We Didn't Start the Fire, written by Billy Joel back in 1989. And that, that particular pop song is looking at 40 years of history, mainly American, but a lot of headlines had to do with uh, European politics as well. And I guess if we take that particular viewpoint of how the world tries to see current events, where there's problem after problem after problem after decade after decade after century after century, the problems are just going to keep on continuing um, with no end in sight. You just try and do the best you can and just live each day um, as best as you can, live your life as best you can. Um, but if that was our viewpoint, it's not really much for us. So this other quote I particularly like, written about two and a half thousand years ago, it was the prophet Daniel who stood before the then known ruler of the world and said this to him. He says, the most high rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he will. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, what are you doing? And that essentially is our objective for this evening, to see that whatever events might be happening in the world, whatever might have events might have happened in, in history, is that God does work in the kingdoms of men. He rules in the kingdoms of men, and not only from a political point of view, but also from an individual point of view. We have, God has this involvement with us if we choose for that to happen. Okay, a little bit of history. Just a quick um, overview. A lot of you will be familiar with this particular image, the nightmare that uh, King Nebuchadnezzar had um, about two and a half thousand years ago. He dreamt, part of his dream, his nightmare, was this particular image, which is made up of various metals, um, which we'll find out later to become the successive kingdoms or representative of successive kingdoms or empires um, which increase in strength, according to the, the metal, but they actually decrease in value or worth. So starting at the head of gold, we finally end up with the feet of part of iron and part of clay. Just a quick review of the head. New uh, Nebuchadnezzar are this head of gold. So this is talking about the Babylonian Empire. Uh, Babylon reigned, uh, its, uh, its height of its empire was between 605 to 539 BC. Um, Neo-Babylon was very much a golden empire. Um, Herodotus uh, talks about the golden image of Marduk upon a golden throne uh, before a golden table and a golden altar. So Babylon very much uh, well depicted in that head of gold. And Pliny, uh, who wrote a bit later, he talked about the robes of the priests being interlaced uh, with, with gold. 
Later on, we have the chest and the arms of silver. And we find out later in Daniel that when Daniel talks to Belshazzar, who is Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, he says that your kingdom is going to be divided and it will be given to the Medes and the Persians. So we can work out that the Medes and Persians were the, the, the silver empire. Um, they reigned between 539 to 331 BC. And it's interesting that they were initially a dual kingdom uh, whose elements were welded together by Cyrus of Persia. So hence you've got the two arms um, coming together. And in the Medo-Persian Empire, silver was used as an endowment as well as their monetary system. Coming down the image, we come to see the belly and the thighs made of brass or bronze. Daniel says, another third kingdom of brass shall bear rule over all the earth. And this we find out to be Greece, that's 331 to 168 BC. It talks about the Hellenistic Empire of Alexander the Great and his successors. And Josephus records that the Medo-Persian Empire um, would actually be destroyed by a king from the west uh, clad in bronze rather than brass. Brass and bronze are very similar alloys. But as far as the Greeks were concerned, they used uh, bronze in their body armour, in their battle axes and in their spear tips. Later on down the image, we come to the legs which were made of iron, uh, two legs, which is quite interesting. The fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, as, as iron breaks in all pieces. And this is the kingdom of pagan Rome from 168 BC all the way through the life of Christ to, uh, when he was on earth to uh, the year 476 AD. Um, it was an, a divided Grecian uh, Rome Empire which fell to the Romans uh, finally in 168 BC at the Battle of Pydna, which is in, in modern Greece. And it's interesting that particular battle, even though the Greeks outnumbered the Romans almost double, uh, commentators have suggested that it was the lack of participation by some of the Grecian troops, um, the the close combat that the Romans could, um, could use compared to the Greeks, uh, plus a number of other different factors that enabled the Romans to, uh, to finally win that battle. The Roman Empire was referred to as the Iron Monarchy uh, due to their weapons, their armour um, being made of iron and of course their strength uh, during various battles. And Gibbon um, when he talked about, when he wrote about Rome, he wrote this, that the images of gold, silver and brass used to represent kings and empires successively destroyed by the Iron Monarch. And finally, we come to the feet, part of iron and partly clay. And we find out in Daniel that the reason for that part iron, part clay is that they, the kingdom will be partly strong and partly weak. They shall mingle themselves. In other words, they might intermarry. They might, um, they might have some sort of alliance, but they will not cleave one to another. There will still be divisions between these various kingdoms. And this speaks of the divided kingdoms, which existed from AD 476 to the end of time, to our present day here in 2017. Now, back in 351 AD, the barbarian tribes, such as the Vandals and the Goths, had begun incursions on Roman territories, started um, overtaking the Roman Empire. And finally, after the collapse of the Roman Empire, ten kingdoms, which included the Goths, the Anglo-Saxons, the Vandals and the Franks, arose. And we have today the modern nations, such as Germany, Britain, Italy, and France as the descendants, if you like, of these ancient kingdoms. Coming to a zany zoo, we're having a look at it, another part of a vision that Daniel had in which we can tie in the, the nightmare of King Nebuchadnezzar who dreamed about this met metallic image and then finally some images that Daniel was presented with 
a lion-like creature, a bear-like creature, and a leopard-like creature, and then finally a fourth beast, which is described as being dreadful and terrible, exceeding strong. It had huge hind teeth, and in verse 19 of Daniel chapter 7 it says it had nails of bronze. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet, so trampling the residue of all the other kingdoms beforehand. It was different from all the other beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. And there was another little horn before which three fell. Now we could talk, we could talk at great length about the, the pagan Roman Empire, which eventually formed the papal Roman Empire, but I'm not going to because we don't have time. Um, but one of the key points about why it was different is you'll notice the other, four, the other three beasts were, uh, I guess, mammalian in appearance, the lion, the bear, and the leopard. The fourth beast is very much reptilian. Um, and later on in Revelation, that same beast is described as being a, a dragon. Now, upon this, uh, upon this beast's head, there were ten horns, um, three which fell before a little horn. So of those ten kingdoms, which we looked at, the Vandals, the Goths, the Ostrogoths, etc., the Ostrogoths, the Vandals, and the Heruli fell before this other a little horn, and that was the rise of the, the, the papal um, reign. As I said, we could go further, um, but that's just a quick um, image just showing the, the regions of those ten kingdoms, um, and you can see the, the, the relationship of those ancient kingdoms, the Anglo-Saxons up there in Britain, the Franks in around France and Belgium, uh, the Visigoths and the Suavi down in Spain and Portugal, the Vandals in northern Africa, the Heruli and the Burgundians in uh, the south of France and, and Italy, and a couple of other uh, nations uh, there. So that's a little bit of a history lesson, but what of so much the modern uh, political Europe? Well, let's just start off by saying that modern Europe, modern Europe is not represented as British Israel. British Israel is a movement which originated in the 16th century. Um, and it basically proclaims that the so-called ten lost tribes of Israel, the northern kingdom, eventually became modern Europe. And various writers, including John Wilson in 1840, who wrote lectures on our Israelite um, origin, uh, set about to prove that nations such as the USA and as Britain were descended from these so-called lost tribes. Um, there are organisations throughout British Empire and the Americas. Uh, they, as I said, they claim uh, Britain to be descended from Ephraim and the USA to be descended from Manasseh. And the remaining eight tribes, um, comprising the old northern kingdom of Israel, are supposedly other European nations. And that's just one of their little charts that they use up there just to explain, um, explain that. However, um, as dedicated as they are to apparently to, to prophecy, um, their claims can be refuted. The Encyclopedia Britannica in 1910 said that the theory is deemed by scholars both theological and anthropological to be utterly unsound. Um, a, recent, a scholar, Hale, in 2015 says that there is overwhelming cultural, historical and genetic evidence against it. Uh, British Israel actually has links to anti-Semitism, which is kind of ironic considering they're supposed to be the uh, lost tribes of Israel. And the arguments that they present are very much based upon unsubstantiated and highly speculative research. Uh, John Wilson um, himself was no scholar. He was self-taught, self-trained, um, and as a result their arguments <coughs> tend to fall flat on, the, flat on their face. Uh, including uh, Bible understanding. So if we're trying to identify modern Europe and its relationship to what we've just read about here in Ezekiel 38, we need to come back to um, some other sources. So here's um, a map. It is not, it is not overly um, accurate, but it was the best uh, that I could find um, at the time, which 
suggests various nations and their modern day equivalents. Um, Tarshish up there in the, the United Kingdom, Goma over in, in France, uh, Israel is Israel, Persia is modern day Iran, uh, Sheba down there in the south of Saudi Arabia, uh, Togomar up there in Turkey, and Gog up there in Russia. The term Mago, um, I would suggest is not there, it actually should be over me uh, further, uh, further west, uh, and we'll have a look at that uh, in, in shortly. If you can see the screen on the, on the top right there, it says that Goma, and it's very, very small print, so I apologise for that, Goma says it's north central Turkey. So why there is Goma over there in the west um, in France? And we'll have a look at that um, as well, why the, two, um, why the two regions. So the nations of Ezekiel 38, which uh, James read to us this evening, identified as modern Europe. I'm not going to go through all the nations, but just some of the, the key players. So looking at Rosh, Meshach and Tubal, Magog and Goma, Togomar, Sheba and Dedan, and finally Tarshish and all their young lions. Why didn't I mention Gog? Well, Gog is actually a ruler and not a nation. According to the Septuagint, which was the, uh, the, 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 the scriptures uh, written by written by Jewish scholars into Greek. They translated that particular phrase in Ezekiel 38 in verse 2 as reading, Gog, of the land of Magog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Shubal. And I'm not going to go through all the, uh, the linguistics of that, but just say that it's interesting to note that Gog is also the ruler of Magog. And the aim this evening is to see that this ruler is to be an autocrat of both Russia and Germany um, to come in the, in the near future um, as we understand Bible prophecy. Looking at Rosh, Meshach and Tubal, a man named Bokart, I think that's how you pronounce his name, Bokart, in 1640 wrote that Ross or Rosh, is the most ancient form under which history makes mention of the name of Russia. He also wrote that from Ross and Meshech, which are the Rossi and Mosky, of whom Ezekiel speaks, descended the Russians and the Muscovites, nations of the greatest celebrity in European Scythia. We're going to have a look at that particular uh, group of people, that the, the Scythians, uh, shortly. The Ross are a Scythian nation, bordering on the northern Taurus, on the northern uh, Taurus mountains. So just up north of Turkey. In Ezekiel chapter 27 and verse 13, we read that Tubal and Meshech are traders in brass or bronze, which is, as I said, is an alloy. But part of that alloy is the, the, the straight metal copper, which is abundant in Siberia. Looking at Magog and Goma, they are two sons of Japheth, and that should have been had a reference there in, in Genesis chapter um, 7, I think. Josephus and Herodotus wrote of these two that they travelled from the Taurus Mountains and finally entering Europe. To cut a long story short, Magog is referred to by the Greeks as the, the Scythe, and Goma is referred to by the Greeks as the Galate. Herodotus um, wrote that a portion of these people turned back and settled in Asia, and hence that region in northern Turkey. Uh, so they actually retained their name, and we know them as the Galatians of the New Testament. The Scythians were also called the Gete, or the, 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 Go the Gothi, from which we get the word Goth. And Mago, in, re in reference to the Scythe, are to be considered in geographical connection with Goma, or the Galate, to properly determine modern location. So wherever you would find Mago, you would also find Goma uh, next door. So continuing Mago and Goma. Diodorus, in about 100 years prior to Josephus, wrote that <coughs> Traces of Mago, he traces Mago past the Danube to the shores of the Baltic, 
locating them as Scythia above or north of Galatia. So that's Galatia of, um, of Europe, not Galatia of, of Turkey. And Galatia, as we said, is the common name used by the Greek historians for Gaul, uh, later on called uh, the Celte by the Greeks, and from which we have modern France, which was uh, which following it on from the, uh, the subduing by the Franks when they invaded that particular region. Now, the Franks themselves came from the northern parts of Gaul, which is modern Germany. So if we have a look at Magog and Goma, we have Magog north and Goma Goma South, which fits in um, with Josephus and Herodotus. Come down to uh, Togemar. Not much is described about Togemar, but in verse 6 we are told that Togemar comes from the north quarters. Um, the house of Togemar traded in the Tyrian fairs with horses, horsemen, and mules in Ezekiel 27 and verse 14. Uh, Gibbon writes that the Turkoman uh, cavalry, proudly computed by millions in former times in regions once known as Russian and independent Tartary, which is now modern, modern Turkey. So we could suggest that Togoma is the northern parts of Turkey. And it would seem to suggest that the bands of Togoma's house could refer to Georgia and Circassia. The references of Sheba and Dedan, if we have a look at the genealogies of Genesis chapter 10 and Genesis chapter 25, there are actually two pairs of Sheba and Dedan. One was the third generation from Ham, who was Noah's son, and one was the tenth from Shem, um, better referred to as the grandsons of Abraham by Keturah. The Semitic Sheba in Dedan came to Arabia, and the Hermitic Sheba in Dedan likely to be a North African country near Cush or Ethiopia. So it's the Semitic Sheba or Dedan that we're more interested in. And Ezekiel 27 describes the Sheba and Dedan as being traders in ivory and ebony from the east, precious, clo uh, precious clothes for chariots, carriers for chief spices, precious stones and gold. And in Arabia, very much a prime position for being a convenient trading station um, for Africa and India, where those resources would have come from. Coming now to Tarshish and all the young lions. Two locations are actually identified in scripture. When Solomon imported gold, ivory, silver, apes and peacocks, we can safely assume that he imported them from India. But when Jonah sailed west from Joppa, it would make sense that he was travelling west, not, um, not east, towards India. We further read in Ezekiel that Tarshish was your merchant by reason of the multitude of all kinds of riches with silver, iron, tin and lead. And these are metals of Britain, referred to by the trading Phoenicians as Baratanak or the land of tin. So we actually have a northern and an eastern Tarshish as an imperial and a merchant power respectively. And if we consider the British Commonwealth and her merchant companies, including, the India, including India, even though, she's not, even though India is not part of Britain um, today, there is, that, there is that strong connection. So what could we expect to happen in modern Europe? And as I said, I'm, I'm no prophet. Um, but some of the things that if we take those modern names and now apply them to Ezekiel chapter 38, there are some things that we could infer from this reading uh, from this evening. We could expect to see an increase of Russian might and influence if we're looking at the land of Magog and Gog being our chief prince over them. We would see some sort of an alliance of European nations we would see two hostile parties composed of a number of groups in conflict. 
and we would also see Israel as a target for, for some of these nations. Now, just looking at some of the headlines over the last week, I'm not going to go into a detail, detail um, analysis of any of these um, headlines, but they, they jumped out at me as being, as being fairly typical of these sorts of expectations. You might, have some, uh, you might be more aware of some other headlines that have uh, a bit more uh, punch to them. But this one here was 30th of December 2016. And the headline reads, Syrian ceasefire, a sign of Russian might and waning of US influence, which was written in the ABC News. And the commentator, the, the journalist, wrote that Putin has played a strong, brutal hand, steamrolling negotiations and international condemnation in pursuit of military dominance. And now he has it. For those of you not aware, Putin was um, ex-KGB and so very much a, a strong military uh, background. And it's interesting to note, and this is the final comment um, on this particular article, the UN's top negotiator wasn't overtly involved in this breakthrough either. The strongmen, Mr Putin and Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan, were centre stage. And I thought that was very, very interesting that Russia is showing her might and influence in such delicate matters, and the US not so much. In regards to Putin, some people have suggested that he is the, the Gog, the ruler, uh, spoken of Ezekiel 38. It's interesting to note that as far as Putin is concerned, that towards the end of his last term, which is in 2012, he changed the ruling um, in Russia. So it's normally a president is to take um, a term of four years and then they can have a second term if, if they are re-elected but then they have to take a term um, out, of, out of office, so another four years. But towards the end of um, Putin's reign in 2012, he actually changed that and he said, nah, look, I think a president can actually go for six years instead for a term. In other words, you could so you could have a, a total of 12 years in office. And then he also swapped his position with his prime minister, so which means that he was effectively out of the office for a while and now he's back in power and not look liking to, uh, to step aside in the very near future. So some people have strongly suggested that Putin um, is the Gog or the ruler um, here in Ezekiel 38. <coughs> Looking at an alliance between Germany and France, the alliances between Germany and France have been a little bit on and off over the last decade or so. But a presidential candidate by the name of Macron and the headline reads, Macron mania signals rebirth of strong Franco-German alliance. And it's interesting that previous uh, presidential uh, campaigners had actually offended um, the, the prime, I think prime minister of, um, of Germany. And this particular uh, comment uh, reads, the unlikelihood of Franco-German alliance may now change. Emmanuel Macron has already been to Berlin twice this year, and this is written just um, only the other day, on the 27th of April. On one visit, he demonstrated his grasp of Diplo Kitsch by presenting Sigmar Gabriel, the German foreign minister and social democrat heavyweight, with a teddy bear to be passed on to his newborn child. And when Merkel broke protocol by receiving Macron in her Berlin office, she artfully ensued the blinds were not pulled down giving snappers a chance to record the de facto endorsement. So it'd be very interesting to see how that particular relationship pans out. Nations in conflict. Well, that just seems to be pretty much all the, uh, all the, the foreign news these days, nations in conflict. But this one uh, stuck out at me, it's written on the 28th of April. And it's talking about the US and Russia. Now, US and Russia have had a fairly uh, a cloudy past, somewhat shaky. There have been some um, attempts to, to make an alliance, but there's still that, that apprehension, that doubt. And this headline, I think, sort of caps that off. Are the US and Russia staking out territorial clout in Syria? And this journalist writes this, although the external players, in particular the United States and Russia, 
officially deny Syria is being divided into de facto zones of influence, the separate use of the military facilities testifies to the opposite. However, if the parties manage to channel the conflict onto a political track, Russian and US troops may act as guarantors of the Syrian-style Dayton Agreement. Now, I had to look up what the Dayton Agreement was all about, and the Dayton Agreement is this. Back in 1995, um, the, the Bosnians and the Serbians came to an agreement which was uh, chaired, if you like, by the, by the US. However, a recent article that I read says, look, 20 years on, um, the people in Bosnia are suffering. Um, and I'm wondering if this particular journalist, journalist is thinking the, along the same track. Is this heading towards an uneasy standoff, um, an uneasy situation between uh, Syria, or the U US and Russia? Well, time, well, of course, will tell. But Russia also appears in the, next, um, in the next article, looking at Israel as a target. And this comes from the 27th of April, from the Jerusalem Post. A Patriot missile was fired at drone entering Israeli airspace from Syria. Israel fired a Patriot anti-ballistic, so Patriot is one of their defence uh, defense systems. They fired a Patriot anti-ballistic missile in, in the north on Thursday, reportedly intercepting a drone that entered Israel's airspace from Syria. The interception comes hours after Israel allegedly struck a Hezbollah arms depot near Damascus International Airport, a move condemned by Russia, which called it a gross violation of Syrian sovereignty. And as I read this article, I couldn't help but think, yeah, but Russia, didn't you invade Georgia and Crimea in the last, um, in the decade? But, oh well. In March, Syria warned that Scud missiles would be fired toward Israeli targets if Israel carried out any further airstrikes in the war-torn country. Uh, Beirut's Adaya daily reported that Damascus had prepared four Scuds out of their arsenal of 800 which can carry half a tonne of explosives and would launch them without any prior warning if Israel carried out a strike, as Israel does not announce their raids against Syrian targets. Well, nobody really does, anyway. So I just thought that's quite interesting. The, um, the Russian presence in Syria at the moment, um, their condemnation of, um, of Israel's approach uh, towards defending uh, their nation against uh, a Syrian attack and, um, and very much a potential uh, escalation of war there. Well, we could continue to talk about uh, the, the current day events, but as I said, I'm not an expert um, in it, and rather than confuse myself or confuse you, I'd like to come back to the point of how the Almighty will continue to rule in the, in the kingdoms of men. We read later on in Ezekiel chapter 38 from verses 18 and then into chapter 39 and to the end of verse 20 that God proclaims a judgment on Gog and his confederacy. And we read in Daniel chapter 2 and, in, and also chapter 7 that kingdoms of men will be replaced with one that shall never be destroyed. And that's the other part of the nightmare that King Nebuchadnezzar had, the stone which would crush the image at its feet and break it to powder and finally grow into a, a mountain filling the whole earth. And we read later on in Revelation that it is a kingdom where there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, and there shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away, but rather it will be one of glory, purity, salvation, light, and eternity. So it is my invitation to you, for those of you who are considering a change in your life, who are worried about the current events in Europe, who are worried about your own salvation, is that we believe that the Bible answers all those and that we all have an opportunity to repent, to be baptised and, God willing, share in that great and glorious kingdom of God.